Hello, everyone. Um, this is an online session about engaging donors through events in person and virtually. So this session is held by uh, KBF uh, US and uh, New York Foundation. We are working on uh, improving the fundraising activities here in Hungary together on this topic. And uh, we are uh, going to uh, start with a short introduction of KBF US. So let me introduce you Kedi, who will give you a little more details about the foundation. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I mean, uh, Andrea, thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us on time. Uh, we appreciate uh, your commitment and your interest in uh, this discussion. So on behalf of the King Baudouin Foundation US, uh, otherwise known as KBF US, I think Andrea is wise enough to not pronounce all of that. <laughs> on behalf of New York, our partners in New York Foundation and Faircom New York, and of course our wonderful speakers today, uh, thank you for being with us. My name is Kadi Silla. I am senior advisor at KBF US overseeing our Africa portfolio. Uh, but please give me a minute to uh, provide a brief background for those of you in the, in the audience who might not be familiar with KBF US. Uh, we facilitate thoughtful and um, philanthropic giving. And of course, we uh, like to term that is effective philanthropic giving. Um, internationally across borders, including in Africa, which I oversee, uh, in Europe, and now in Latin America. So uh, definitely expanding there. Through a tool that we call the American Friends Fund, uh, KBF US allows or rather enables foreign nonprofits uh, to be able to uh, fundraise in the United States through a cost-effective solution. And also at the same time, enabling US donors to support their favorite causes in all the areas where we operate in, which I had mentioned before. Uh, currently, we are at over 600 uh, American Friends Fund, essentially our fiscal sponsorship programming. And some of our partners around the world are La Grande Chancellerie de la Légion d'Honneur, uh, which is in France. Uh, we also have Van Gogh Museum in the Netherlands, um, as well as the uh, Nelson Mandela Road Scholar in South Africa, just to name a few. Um, and really, in this context, KBF US allows, um, again, nonprofits to be able to raise funds in the US, removing barriers so that they don't have to trouble themselves um, maintaining, setting up and maintaining their own 501c3. If you're interested in our fiscal sponsorship uh, programming, which is our American Friends Fund, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help. And my contact will be shared um, at the end of this session. So, Another thing that I wanted to mention um, about KBF US, especially in, in the context of today's discussion, is that in addition to providing uh, the ser fiscal sponsorship services that we have, as well as supporting donors, KBF US also provides fundraising services, um, like this session right here. Uh, we have this through a program that we call the Art and Science of Fundraising, which we used to have in person every spring. Every spring um, used to be a three days intensive programming, which brings together um, higher education institutions in Europe and Africa and cultural institutions as well to collaborate, to peer learn, and also learn from some of the most talented professionals, fundraising professionals in our networks, both in New York City and around the world. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, we've had to uh, pivot that programming online, and today's discussion is exactly part of that strategy. Um, that said, our hope is that, of course, you sincerely, um, we sincerely hope that you're able to get as much practical lessons learned from this discussion today. You're going to be hearing from two of the most practical people um, that have learned to pivot to address their fundraising needs in this climate that we have, which is now a uh, an endemic instead of a pandemic. So our hope is that a lot of what would be discussed today would be applicable to your current fundraising needs. Uh, but if you're interested in learning more, please don't hesitate to reach out to um, me at KBF US or um, Flavia, who you would hear from in a second. Now, um, I wanted to share a couple of uh, housekeeping notes before we uh, move toward to get us a better sense of who our speakers are on this panel today. Uh, please 
make sure that you can um, change your name on, on your screen and then add your organization so we have a sense of where you're coming from. KBF US, like Faircom New York, New York, uh, our global institution. So we wanna be able to see how reflective um, that is in the, in the attendee list. So please, please add your name as well as your organization so we have a sense of who you are and where you're coming from. Um, as you can tell, we are in a webinar session, which means that only the speakers will be heard. Um, everybody's video is off, um, but if you're able to uh, post questions, uh, please note that we are not, um, the chat function is, is disabled, but there is a Q&A function right at the bottom of your screen in Zoom where you can, um, it's a function that you can use to post your questions. So feel free to do that. We will monitor that Q&A um, function and those questions will be addressed throughout this, uh, the session or most likely around the end. Um, the videos and all resources from this session would be shared after. Uh, something that we will be posting on both KBF US website and I'm sure also in Faircom, but in case you don't receive uh, anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And Flavia will also share her contact uh, for that. Without further delay, please allow me to introduce our incredible speakers today. We have Michelle uh, Pico, who is calling us. I'm going to speak, uh, say the names in French because I speak French. That's a privilege. Uh, we have, we have uh, Michelle Pico, who is calling from Paris. Um, Michel is the president of Notre Dame de Paris, and he's been in this position since um, 2016. Um, and Not for Friends of Notre Dame de Paris is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to raising funds and build the iconic uh, Paris cathedral that we know to be uh, Notre Dame. Michel, uh, in collaboration with Flavia, had successfully transitioned his organization from in-person virtual uh, in-person events to virtual events because of the pandemic again, which is essentially an endemic at this point. So there's you know, a lot of uh, good nuggets to be shared here in that experience. Um, and this was done with Flavia Alimanti, who is currently uh, the director of global philanthropy affair from New York. Before Notre Dame de Paris, Michel held various leadership positions. Um, in various organized global organizations. For instance, he was COO for international markets of the Demos Group, one of the leading European learning and in development companies, and was also president and CEO of HR Resources, HR Access Solutions, sorry, uh, which is a leading human resources software, part of uh, Fidelity Investment, among many other accolades, which we unfor unfortunately don't have the time to go over, uh, which it, it could be its own webinar. So I'm hoping that you had a chance to read uh, Michelle's bio. Now, as I mentioned before, Flavia has collaborated with Michelle in, uh, on different fundraising strategies, including pivoting to virtual events, which we'll be discussing this uh, session. But Flavia, um, has about a decade of experience in fundraising, um, global experience uh, by that in fundraising and communications with a, a primary focus on partnerships with international organizations or fundraising in the US and across the, um, around the world. Uh, right now, uh, serving as a director of global philanthropy as uh, at Faircom New York, which I had mentioned before. Uh, in addition to this, Flavia has ex extensive experience advising nonprofits of varying scope and scale um, as they define and implement their own fundraising strategies through major and um, global donors um, and institu institutional donors and programs. She's also developed uh, communication tools, conceiving and implementing events from inception to implementation. In the interest of time, I think our, our speakers will speak for themselves and you would, uh, we hope again that this will be as practical to your needs as possible. I would like to welcome uh, Flavia and Michelle and thank you all again for being here. Over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. So today we are going to talk about events and how to effectively incorporate them into your fundraising toolkit. So we will discuss why organize events, how to effectively plan an event, and how to keep the momentum going after your event. As Katie mentioned, there'll be a Q&A period after the presentation. So if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to drop them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. 
So why organize events? Events are a common tool for fundraising across the board. And while Michelle and I will speak to some of the particularities of the US perspective, uh, this may require some adaptation for the Hungarian context. But essentially, the fundamentals of event planning apply to all events, no matter where you are based or how large or small your organization is. So events play a role as part of your broader fundraising strategy. They're helpful as a tool to engage donors across all aspects of the fundraising cycle. So for example, they can help identify and qualify prospects. Uh, when you qualify a prospect, you determine you know, whether or not they're interested in your mission and would potentially support you. Events can help you cultivate those prospects and your existing donor base, deepening the person's understanding of your work and relationship with your organization. They can be used as an occasion to ask people to support your organization. And different types of events can be used to steward your donors. Uh, after they have made their gift, you can use cultivation events to give updates and show how their support makes an impact because donors like to feel involved and to see how they're helping to make a difference. So the first step is to determine your objectives. Uh, per you know, your target audience before the logistics and planning really starts in earnest, as this will help determine the type of event that you will ultimately produce. There are three primary objectives, building awareness, strengthening relationships, and fundraising. And you can have more than one objective, but it's important to identify your primary objective and your secondary objective so that everyone involved is on the same page and you know you think you're planning a visibility event but then someone asks you why you're not raising funds uh, so it's important to to define that uh, off the, the bat so for example if your target audience for an event is major donors what would be your primary objective are you trying to fundraise from your existing major donor base are you introducing people to your work who do have the capacity to give at a major donor level, but they are new prospects for you? Or are you cultivating your current major donors and thanking them for their support? And so we have mapped out different types of events and target objectives. And while I note that events have been a valuable in-person engagement channel throughout the pandemic, nonprofits were forced to reevaluate their strategies and bring those experiences online. So virtual events like webinars, like we're doing right now, virtual roundtables, virtual galas have really expanded the fundraisers toolkit, uh, allowing groups to reach audiences without the limitations of geographic location. And really going forward, a mix of in-person and virtual events will be the norm. So planning an event is not a one and done activity. That approach will likely not be effective for your organization in the long term. It's really important to incorporate events as part of your annual fundraising strategy, using them as tools as you build relationships with your donors and your prospects. And so it's important to put in the preparatory work to create the conditions leading up to the event that are appropriate for the type of event you are creating and match your objectives. The types of events you organize may evolve as your needs change. For example, at the beginning, you may strictly organize visibility events to build an audience and raise awareness about your work. And then from there, building up to the point where you are asking for gifts and using events to steward your donors. Of course, in between, it's important to continue implementing your strategy and, and continue those cultivation engagement efforts. And so I'll turn it over to Michelle, uh, who will speak more about how this works specifically for Friends of Notre Dame de Paris. Thank you very much. Uh... Flavia, and thank you, Caddy, for the introduction. So what, what I will do, um, I will give you um, the example of Friends of Notre Dame de Paris and, and uh, how we use the events in our uh, fundraising together with uh, FAIRCOM. So first of all, uh, for you to know Friends of Notre Dame de Paris is a relatively uh, young charity. It was uh, created in uh, 2016. Uh, so before uh, the fire, uh, which damaged the cathedral in uh, 2019, 
And at that time, we created the, the charity because the, the cathedral uh, Notre Dame de Paris was already in a very bad state and uh, needed repairs. And so uh, we, we started. And um, in the first instance, we discussed uh, what we could do in terms of fundraising at international level together with the, uh, the French uh, embassy to the US. And um, we, we discussed and we, we discussed with FAIRCOM and our idea was effectively, uh, first of all, to create some visibility for our project to uh, restore the cathedral. And to do so, we organized a, a, a first uh, large event uh, um, at the uh, French uh, consulate in uh, New York. And you can see a picture of this event here. And uh, at, this was a free event. So we, we were absolutely not uh, known uh, in the US. Uh, we had no visibility. People were not aware that the cathedral was in a very bad state. And so we tried to identify potential uh, major donors. Uh, we invited them uh, to this event. So this event was free, as I said. And this was for us a, a very good, uh, a very good way of uh, uh, raising this visibility. And uh, this was the starting point actually for us. Uh, so in this, um, in this fall of uh, 2018. Uh, afterwards, so we, we followed up on with, with new events uh, and, and we, we began when we uh, began to have this visibility to organize a paid event. But uh, once more, this was done step by step and, and mostly with relatively uh, limited events in terms of number of people uh, gathered at each of our events. And also, um, I need to mention that one, one good way for us to uh, progress was also to, um, to work with uh, our board of directors that we uh, created uh, from the beginning. And uh, we, um, we ensured that we, we had uh, members of the board in the US uh, in New York, in Washington, but also progressively in all the important cities in the US, who would be in a position to help us with their network to uh, reach uh, potential uh, major donors. So this is a little bit how we, um, we used events to uh, support our uh, fundraising strategy in the US uh, before, before we entered uh, actually the uh, pandemic period. So what I need to say is that before entering the pandemic period, we had also another very specific event, which was this terrible fire of uh, April 15, uh, 2019. And evidently for us, it was a dramatic event because um, what we had to do to restore the cathedral was um, immediately uh, multiplied and uh, we, uh, we were in front of uh, a task which was not only to restore the cathedral, but, but to uh, reconstruct the cathedral, which had been partly destroyed. But on the other hand, evidently, uh, in terms of uh, visibility of our project of restoration, so it increased immediately uh, the visibility. Um, and this was evidently a, a very good support in terms of fundraising, even if it was very dramatic in terms of uh, the cathedral itself. So then we, uh, after, after that, so we, after this uh, fire, so we were able to organize um, um, I would say uh, paid uh, events, so uh, events where we effectively sold uh, seats and tables for these events. And um, I can give you an example of one event that we organized in the fall of uh, 2019, so after the fire. So we were able to organize this uh, very large event in New York. I think it's two slides later and I will get back to slide nine afterwards. So um, uh, in this event, we organized it in, um, in a restaurant in, uh, in New York and we, uh, and we got the support of uh, major sponsors for our project of restoration of Notre Dame. So uh, one of them being the, um, the Archbishop of New York, who, uh, 
accepted effectively to uh, to sponsor our event uh, in this restaurant in New York. We were able also to get the sponsorship of uh, um, one very uh, famous uh, winemaker in France uh, by the name of Chateau Margaux, who also supported us for the organization of the event. And, and progressively, so we were able with our board members in, uh, in New York to organize a dinner with uh, paid uh, seats and paid tables for about uh, 100 people, which helped us a lot because it helped us effectively raise a significant amount of money. So around $400,000 in this uh, one event we had in New York in the fall of 2019. So this is for the uh, in-person events. In terms of uh, now virtual events, uh, and, and we move to the uh, pandemic period, uh, we entered the beginning of 2020. So during this uh, pandemic uh, period, so we uh, decided to move uh, to virtual events, which was the only way effectively to uh, reach our potential donors. And in this, um, in this respect, uh, together with uh, one of our uh, board members in uh, Chicago, we, um, we succeeded getting the uh, collaboration of uh, many uh, or several uh, famous uh, people. So uh, one of them being the, uh, the cellist uh, Yo-Yo Ma, uh, whom you perhaps know, and this uh, very famous uh, uh, musician accepted to uh, to sponsor our project because of his uh, uh, attachment and, and, and I would say love for Notre Dame. And he gave uh, uh, two pieces of music for our virtual uh, event. We were able also to, uh, to get a sponsorship from, from uh, um, a famous uh, actress, Glenn, uh, Glenn Close, and, and several other uh, famous people who accepted to participate uh, in this virtual event and to give uh, to give a testimony or to give or to play a piece of music as i said to uh, help us um, i would say uh, uh, raise money for uh, the restoration and the, the reconstruction and the restoration of notre dame de paris and and this virtual event in the end it was uh, so it was organized with uh, effectively the technical support of uh, a production uh, company um, who ensured that we could have uh, hundreds of uh, online participants in this virtual event. And, um, and, and we succeeded actually uh, by organizing a system of sponsorship for the events. So not only, uh, um, I would say, participation in the event at a basic level, but also some, some high level donors accepted to sponsor the event and to give a higher uh, sum of money for our project, we succeeded having uh, hundreds of uh, participants in this uh, event in the first instance. And this was even uh, so successful that uh, uh, we had to organize a, a repeat of the event uh, one month later. And overall, we, we were able to raise uh, $350,000 uh, from this uh, uh, virtual event, so in the fall of uh, 2020. So now if I move uh, to uh, what we did uh, after the reopening um, in terms of uh, cultivation and, uh, and stewardship uh, events, so we continued with uh, online events. We continued uh, in, uh, in uh, two ways. So first of all, we created, um, we created a society of uh, mid-level uh, donors which we call the 1163 uh, Society. Uh, 1163, because this is the year of uh, when the first uh, stone of uh, Notre Dame de Paris was laid in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. And so with this 1163 Society, we organize what we call uh, expert talks uh, every six months. So we, we succeed uh, gathering um, donors uh, online and uh, giving them uh, an update on the progress of the restoration project of the cathedral. And, um, and we regularly, I would say, 
uh, send them also information uh, about our project in order for them to understand, because I think this is the most important part, to, to understand how uh, the money which is donated to uh, Notre Dame is uh, utilized and, uh, and what are the, the progress that we are making in uh, the restoration of, uh, of the cathedral. We have also some uh, stewardship uh, events that we organize. Uh, we call them uh, Café uh, Cathedral, Café Cathedral. And uh, this is also a way to, uh, I would say, uh, not only uh, motivate, but also inform our donors and ensure that progressively they respond in the, in the course of the project they respond with uh, subsequent uh, donations to the ones they, they did initially um, to, to uh, our project. So you see this, um, apart from the events, I would say this type of online uh, stewardship of our uh, donors is very important. And, and for us, it's also a way to uh, progressively increase the reach of our project uh, in the market. So. Uh, so that's for the um, that's for the um, uh, additional uh, event or I would say actions that we uh, what, that we uh, lead to uh, I would say push the uh, interest for our project among our donors existing or, or new ones. Uh, uh, Flavia, I, I turn to you uh, because I think you are the one. Uh, work who is going to uh, give us some more information about these uh, events strategy. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you for sharing all those examples. So once you have decided to organize an event and you've identified your objectives, you can think about the building blocks of what goes into actually producing your event. So consider, you know, really the, the basic components of determining what your theme will be, what type of format you're going to do, if it'll be in-person or virtual or a hybrid of both, who is your intended audience. If it's a fundraising event, how will you raise funds? Will it be through paid tickets and table sales, sponsorships? Will you have an auction? Will you do a fund to need or a similar call for cash? It's important to build an event budget and to develop a calendar and timeline to keep you on track. And then you can move on to logistics of you know, finalizing the, the venue if it's in person or uh, your virtual events platform or production company if it's online. Developing a program that will be engaging for your audience, identifying and approaching speakers, determining what type of collateral you will need to produce, uh, identifying and sourcing vendors that you will need on the night of. And when thinking about a fundraising event, the goal really should be to break even. And so with visibility events, they are an investment and likely won't recoup the costs on the night of because raising money is not your objective. We've seen that some of the most uh, useful events really have the payoff in the follow-up and perhaps not on the night of itself, but it's really the, the conversations that continue and the relationships that grow from the event and result in successful partnerships or significant gifts after the fact. And so we've prepared you know, sample event budgets um, that we can share after this presentation, as well as a sample strategy planning outline that lays out the key points that your decision makers uh, should agree on as you head into your discussions and, and event organization. And another very important consideration is how your volunteer leadership can play a role in your event. In the US, the board of directors plays an active role that is more fundraising focused. And we know that this may be different from your own experience because this is not always the case with boards in Europe. So this is a particular difference that we're highlighting in the US context. Um, but besides the board of directors creating a volunteer group for a specific event that like a gala host committee is essential to support fundraising focused events. So their primary task is to assist with fundraising. So that is securing uh, ticket sales and sponsorships 
They can give feedback on decisions such as choosing an honoree. They can help define your sponsorship levels and benefits. Um, sending invitations to their network, as Michelle mentioned, uh, that the board members are essential in, in opening uh, their network and inviting guests to the, the fundraising events that we do. And so I will turn it back over to you, Michelle, to speak a bit more about engaging your board members through events. Yes, thank you, uh, Flavia. So actually, um, we have given here an example of a fundraising dinner. This is the dinner I, I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, so you have a few elements about this dinner. So what's very important effectively, uh, when, you, when you have, um, let's say, when you, want, when you organize a fundraising dinner, the, uh, the, key, the key thing is to be able effectively to sell uh, your seats and your tables. And uh, when you start organizing a fundraising event with uh, sold uh, seats and tables, uh, this is the anxiety that you have uh, uh, up front because in the beginning you have uh, costs on the one hand side and uh, not yet sold any ticket uh, before. So what's very important uh, is to be able effectively to rely on, uh, I would say, um, uh, people who are able effectively to convince um, people in their surroundings, so in their network, to uh, buy tickets and buy tables. So very important is to have effectively, um, I would say, uh, the, the support of the event itself. So having uh, famous people or well-known people at your event is evidently a big help. Uh, as I said, uh, when I spoke about this event in New York, so we had the sponsorship and the participation of the Archbishop of New York, which immediately, I would say, brings attention to your event and people are very happy to, to meet with the Archbishop of uh, New York in New York. So that's a first point. If you have effectively also somebody from uh, your embassy, for instance, the ambassador or the consul general, it's also something which uh, helps uh, attracting people to your event. If you have uh, on top of that, uh, a famous uh, winemaker like Chateau Margaux uh, that you can effectively convince to sponsor your, your dinner, it's even better because it's another big name. So, you know, when, when you are able effect effectively to add up uh, Notre Dame de Paris, the Archbishop of New York, uh, Chateau Margaux wine, evidently you have uh, more chance to uh, attract uh, prominent people and, and uh, major donors or major potential donors to your event. So this is the first, uh, I would say for me, so this is the first uh, lesson perhaps that I, I would give is to be able to, to set up an event which is appealing for uh, the uh, participants and which is supporting effectively your, your cause very uh, strongly. Afterwards, and as, and as Flavia said, so you are not immediately sure that you will be able to, uh, to uh, I would say, get uh, uh, funds which will allow you to pay for your cost. So after that, so effectively, the idea is to be able to get uh, donations uh, at the event or after the event. And my, um, my advice, um, in a way, my advice at this stage and for events with major donors is that you need to build up uh, a relationship with your uh, participants, with the, the major donors that you invite to this type of event. And this relationship, this personal relationship that you can build with your uh, friends uh, in, in a broad sense, uh, I think this personal relationship is very important because Afterwards, so after the event itself, this is what will uh, allow you to continue to get the support of these donors uh, all along your project. And so, um, my, my advice at this at this stage would be: okay, so prepare the events uh, carefully, um, get the maximum support from your board of directors, from prominent people to your cause build up relationship with uh, uh, your donors and, and afterwards uh, cultivate this relationship through uh, 
I would say even personal contacts and 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 when it's not personal contact or uh, I would say uh, in person contacts you can you can also uh, cultivate your relationship uh, by uh, by zoom or online and so this is also a way to be able effectively to to consolidate this type of uh, of um, relationship after the uh, events uh, themselves so that's a few a few remarks that I can make at this stage. Thank you, Michelle. And so you started to allude to it um, about you know after the event, what comes next? And as I mentioned uh, earlier in this uh, presentation, events really are a tool to integrate into your broader fundraising strategy. So before your event launches, you should be ready with a plan that will guide your next steps with key audience groups who attended your event. And uh, it's, you know, it's always better to identify these next steps before the event happens, and you can modify things afterwards as needed. So the, the first step, and it may seem insignificant or obvious, but it's very important across the board, no matter what type of event you organize, remember to thank everyone. Send thank you notes to all the attendees, all the speakers, volunteer leadership, everyone who contributed to the event. Uh, you can also ask your uh, board members to send thank you notes to key donors or to VIP attendees uh, as an extra touch point. And you can, you can make it as easy as possible for them by preparing the draft uh, in advance. So all they have to do is press send. If you had a fundraising event, remember to follow up on outstanding payments and pledges, and then source feedback from your key stakeholders to reflect what went well and what could be improved upon for next time. And then consider how will you continue the momentum of the event with your donors and how will you engage new contacts that you met through the event. And so Michelle, you, you mentioned a couple of things already, but I'll turn it back over to you. If you could please describe, you know, some specific examples of cultivation and engagement that you've had with attendees following events. Yeah. So I, so I think after the event, so what's very important is to effectively do the basic, uh, let's say, uh, thank you uh, letters or emails and so on to the participants. Uh, what's also uh, very important in my, uh, my experience is that sometimes you have, you have pledges and sometimes some of, of your uh, pledges are not uh, confirmed immediately. So you need to uh, kindly uh, remind uh, the donors that they have made pledges. So this is also something which is a little bit delicate, but that needs to be done. And afterwards, uh, I would say you need to you need to think about the, um, the next steps because um, the next steps must be, I would say, certainly to uh, inform regularly your uh, participants in the progress of your project. Uh, in our case, it's relatively easy because uh, we have, we have uh, technical uh, progress um, in, in the reconstruction of the cathedral uh, and so on. And, and so, and so this, this gives you also, also the opportunity to organize further events um, in order to effectively both on the one hand side update your donors about your project and, and also to continue to uh, raise funds and, um, and, 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 uh, and get effectively funding for, for your project. What's also, um, what you need also to have in mind is that this is uh, something which needs to be accompanied also by the extension of uh, the network of your donors. And uh, I would say the, the, the number of friends that you can have for your project. And, and in this respect, the existing uh, donors are very important because they have, they have themselves their own uh, network. And if they are convinced that uh, your cause is really the one they, they want to focus upon, they, they, they will be very uh, helpful in, uh, I would say, enlarging the scope of uh, friends and donors that you can uh, acquire for your uh, project. So, the existing donors, so you need to culti cultivate them, but also you need to use them 
as a, a way of uh, acquiring uh, new donors and extending uh, the reach you have for, uh, for your project. One, uh, one, uh, perhaps one thing also that I can um, say at this stage is that in the course of time, if, if your project is a very long standing project, uh, what you may experience is a, is a kind of um, fatigue of your first uh, large sponsors. For instance, you begin with uh, board members, uh, for instance, who are very enthusiastic in the beginning. And after, after some time, they may get a little bit uh, uh, cooler for your project than they were at the beginning. So I think it's very important also at each step of your project uh, and at each step where you want effectively to, to continue to raise funds to your project, it's very important also to find new uh, sponsors uh, who may become uh, board members of your charity or who may become, I would say, sponsors uh, without being board member. But I think the, the fact that you renew also in the, in, the, in the course of time, that you renew also, I would say, the... Um, uh, the people who sponsor your project and help you uh, raise funds, uh, especially uh, through uh, events, uh, because this is very personal, huh, the events, as, as usual. I think it's also an important point to take, to take into account uh, in the course of your, uh, your project. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for your, your time and your attention. And we're happy to answer your questions and, and to speak more. Uh, and so actually now I'll turn it back over to Kadi and Andrea for the Q&A. Thank you, um, Flavia and Michelle. So it's, it seems like what uh, your lessons learned and practices are resonating with people already. Andre, Andras, sorry about that, has an incredible question about building a strong or rather a robust board pipeline, right? How do you recruit them uh, first? How do you ensure that what you need as an organization is aligned with this, board's experience, this board member experience um, and the duties that are required? How do you do that? How do you, is, is it a training? And what is the onboarding process like? So I think that's very important giving the significance of board members in fundraising. Michelle, do you want to talk about your board experience and then I can jump in with yeah. a more general? Yeah, so um, our experience is the following. When we started, um, uh, Friends of Notre Dame de Paris, so we, we had, in the beginning, we had three board members. Uh, and, and I remember very well, I had, I had spoken with the, uh, the attorney who helped us uh, build up the charity. And he said, okay, so it's... Uh, it's a US charity, so you need to have at least one or two board members in the US and maximum one in France because uh, this is a US charity. So we started with, with three uh, board members who were interested in, in the cause. And, and afterwards, um, afterwards we, we added up uh, new board members uh, and we, we were very much helped by the uh, French embassy and the French consulates, uh, because what I said is, okay, so we need to have board members everywhere in the US if we want to be successful in the different uh, markets and large cities in the US. So in my case, I was, uh, I was very much helped by the, uh, the French uh, consulates in the US. And, uh, and each time, uh, I, I had the discussions with the uh, with the consul general, for instance. Uh, I remember very well, and and each time um, he, he gave me uh, one or two names of uh, uh, prominent people in 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 his area or her area, and uh, and and I contacted them, and then I was able progressively to uh, to to I would say enlarge the board with new members. Now, to, to give you uh, the number, we, we have 12 board members um, in, at, Notre, at Friends of Notre Dame de Paris. And, and we, have, we have been able to cover, uh, I would say, uh, major cities in the US. So uh, last one is in Los Angeles. And we, we appointed him recently. So you see, this is a kind of progressive uh, process 
by adding up um, sponsors who can help you uh, in their area by their network and by their knowledge of the area that we we did it. So, um, so this is how we we proceeded in our case. And I would just add to that um, saying, as Michelle mentioned, you know, having a a peer to peer referral and, and is very important in helping them to expand your network and to approach these people, um, as is having, you know, just a very open conversation with the prospective board member about what are their expectations, what are your expectations, what are the, the responsibilities that you would like them to fulfill as a as a board member. Um, do you have any financial required obligations uh, or any give get uh, requirements for for serving on the board? Um, and uh, you know the how many meetings will they have to attend and and what is required of of their time in this role? Because you want to make sure that it's uh, it's fulfilling for both them and for you. Uh, and in terms of the the materials provided to them. Um, yes, that's something that it's it, that helps clarify uh, their role. If you can provide them with, you know, background information about your organization, your programs, uh, any uh, upcoming projects or campaigns that are priorities, where you would like their advice, or you'd like them to maybe reach out to contacts in their network. Um, if you uh, have the the resources to create an, an onboarding toolkit, that is always helpful. You can hold uh, trainings. If you're trying to maybe motivate the board to be a little bit more involved in fundraising, they might not know how to do that. And so taking the time to, to sit with them and explain um, what you're looking for and then how to do it is also very helpful as well. Okay, thank you, Flavia and Michelle. And also another question from Andres. Again, it's a kind of a complex one. Uh, the question is, uh, you mentioned that you uh, use certain uh, methods to raise money even before the event, like selling tickets and sponsoring tables, but is it worse to also involve uh, on-site techniques as well? Do you use at the same time on-site on techniques like uh, auction or, or other, and what kind of techniques could these be? Or, or it's better to leave them uh, on the site and just focus on afterwards uh, on the follow-up. So what is your suggestion? What to use, how to mix it? Is it worse to mix it? What would you suggest? Thank you. So it depends on the type of event and it depends on your audience. Uh, auctions are, you know, they're certainly a great uh, tool for raising funds on the night of, but you need to make sure that you have items that are appealing to your audience. Uh, if you have a specific theme and you have items that tie into that theme, you know, that's um, always nice. Experiences are always nice, or um, even thinking about is there something that you can offer that involves, you know, the children of the people in the room? Because then the, the parents might be more motivated to bid on it if it's something they can do with their kids after the fact. Um, and, and that can be for, you know, a live auction or a silent auction. I would also underscore that auctions are a lot of work because you need to source all of the material, all of the items ahead of time. Um, and that it just requires a lot of a lot of time and involvement um, of, of your volunteer leadership to help you with those. So if you don't have the capacity to do that, maybe an auction isn't the best thing for you to do. Another great thing is um, a fund in need, which is also known as you know a giving waterfall or a call for cash. And so that is when you have uh, the, a speaker at the in the room saying, okay, we're trying to raise let's say $20,000 for um, scholarships for students. Can you help us get there? And then you start at uh, you know, the, the top bidding level and you work your way down with incremental levels. And when you have people in the room and you see people raising their hands to say, yes, I will bid that, it gets, it's very exciting and it's very motivating, especially when you get down to the lower levels, whether that's you know, $500 or $100 to see all of those hands going up and you raise money very, very quickly. Um, and so that's certainly another, another tool that can be used. 
So there are there are definitely you know strategies that you can fundraise on the night of the event. I would also say that you know heading into your fundraising event, you should try to uh, cover the costs through so through sponsorships. Uh, ticket sales and table sales. So by the time your event starts, you've already, you know, covered those costs and anything raised on the night of or afterwards is, you know, icing on top of the cake. Yes. Uh, so basically, uh, as I understand, sometimes it's absolutely okay to use uh, fundraising before the event, on the event, and also we cultivate them afterwards. So no problem with that at all. And I think this is also because uh, uh, not only those people are there who has already paid before, so it's absolutely normal to involve those. For example, if a company buys a table, then maybe those employees who are there are willing to uh, donate as well. So it's absolutely could be useful to involve them as well. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Uh, one uh, more. more? One more question. Uh, what types of platforms do you rec uh, recommend if you would like to organize even online virtually? So it will uh, depend on what you're trying to do. You know, if you're trying to do a webinar like this, Zoom is a great tool with the, the webinar feature. If you're looking for something more involved, um, you will want to go with a, a either a production company or a platform that just has more capabilities. So in the U.S., some of those platforms include, you know, StreamYard, Fundraise, or One Cause. Those are uh, very; they can be very specific to you know U.S. organizations. So I would do research and look into what's available um, to you, and then also that fits your needs because there there's so many companies out there. And so you want to make sure that if you're gonna pay for, for a platform that it really is answering what you're looking for. Okay, thank you. Peter, um, uh, Katie, please. <laughs> no, don't worry. So Peter has a question around uh, tickets, selling tickets for event. Uh, basically the question is, can a very expensive ticket uh, be a good fit for finding a potential major donor, or is it could it be counterproductive? Now, uh, I think I want to put a little bit of a pin on that because expensive is quiet. It could mean a lot of things. So maybe something to keep in mind as we answer the question. But yeah, is it helpful in attracting major donors or is it counterproductive? Michelle, do you want to? Yes, I, th I think the, um, first of all, I think in the, in the first instance, uh, we, we have begun with uh, free events. So which means that when you start uh, selling tickets, uh, seats or tables, when you start in your pro project uh, for the first steps of fundraising, I would not recommend it. So it's better, it's better to, uh, to target people who potentially can give uh, money to, to your project or a lot of money to your project and start with, with something which is free. Afterwards, when, when people have begun to effectively uh, donate for your project, it's easier uh, in the next steps to effectively uh, sell uh, tickets, sell seats, sell tables. And, and in this case, um, uh, the price, it, it's, it's, it depends really on uh, where, where you organize your, your event. You know, in New York, it's, it's not the same as, uh, I don't know, uh, in a, in a smaller town in, in the US. So there is also a kind of market price of, of the uh, uh, fundraising events, depending on the location. And so this is where, and this is where, by the way, the experience of um, your local sponsor or your local board member is very important because he or she will know uh, what is acceptable or not uh, for this type of event in this, uh, uh, defined location. So I would say there is no price. This is, this is really depending on what's affordable. And, and this is also, this depends also on the, uh, the, the degree of maturity of your project and of your fundraising uh, in the market. And I would just add uh, to that, that 
it would depend on your audience as well and how much uh, do you know about your audience if it's if they're completely new prospects that require some research on your side to figure out um, what is their capacity to give and maybe some previous events that they have um, sponsored or, or given if you can find that information or if it's within your own base um, knowing where is their comfort level and um, and I'm not saying that you know in sponsorships you can always ask for above and, and encourage conversations that way um, but just being realistic to where your your audience is at as well. Thank you. Okay, uh, just me also has a question uh, that uh, if we consider this event, uh, fundraising is one of our tools. And if we think of it as a stepping uh, part for our donors, what is your experience that uh, the new or the potential donors, how, how, what percentage of them or, or how many of them start to engage themselves beside the case or next to the case for longer time? How easier to turn them into regular donor or major donor or, or, or be a loyal partner for the case for the future? You mean how you, how, how you, you ensure that your donor continue to give all along your project? This is your question. So I, I think this is really a question of being able to, um, to inform them regularly on the progress of your project, because this is a kind of give and take. So they give you some money to support your project, but you need to, to give them the information on how this money has been uh, used and, and what are the next steps and uh, which, uh, which milestone have you reached in your project. And so you see, this is a kind of give and take. And I think the, the donors, they, they have with the project a very uh, personal uh, relation. You know, and with people managing the project, they want, to be, uh, they want to be informed, they want to be listened to, and they want to be sure that you, you are not uh, taking their money. And then afterwards, uh, this is only uh, something uh, in the middle of a big, uh, a big amount of money. So this is very, um, in my view, this, this, this information and this personal relationship that you can build with your donors is the best way to ensure that they will follow you and they will accompany you all along your project and they will continue to uh, contribute to your project. It would be my, uh, my advice. Thank you. Okay, we are slowly uh, getting to the end of the session. So if there is no more question. I do have a question if I may just one last question. Um, I think what I really appreciate about Michelle's experience and of course, Flavia helping us with the framework is the role of the diaspora. Michelle had underscored over and over again, the role of the embassy, the French embassy here in New York City and in the US in general and creating like a domino effect. You know them personally, they know somebody personally. So the trust is sort of extended in the in the broader network. So I think it'll be helpful to uh, Michelle, if you can sort of highlight what, what's been your general experience engaging diaspora in this process and how, is that, how has that been connected to your fundraising capacity as well? Yeah, so, so what you call the diaspora, it's actually it's uh, the network of the, um, the, uh, the French embassy in the US. Um, basically, uh, all the, uh, there are, uh, I think there are in total 12 consulates, uh, French consulates in the US. And so from the beginning, we, uh, we were supported by the embassy and, and, and progressively uh, also personally by the French ambassador to the US, which is also important, and, and progressively by all the consul generals and, and their teams in the different cities. So, so for us, it was, uh, I would say, critical to have this support uh, on the one hand side. So we relied on, on FAIRCOM, I would say, uh, on the other hand side for the organization of our events and, and, and of our marketing actions. But, you know, in a way, in a way, um, 
So you, you call it the diaspora. So that's one thing. You need to have this technical support on the other hand side. Um, but but in a way, so so you need to find people uh, who are really convinced about your cause. So so for in our case, it's relatively easy because. Um, nearly everybody uh, loves Notre Dame de Paris. So for us, we had a relatively easy task in a way. Uh, and, and with the fire, so it, it increased our effectively the attention. Uh, but I would say for any, uh, for any cause, you need to find people convinced uh, by your cause. And afterwards, you need to get their support. And, and generally, they are very uh, open to, to offer their support. On a, on a very free uh, basis. So, so you need to convince uh, sponsors on your cause, you see? And afterwards, I think it makes things much easier, yeah. And, and I would say perhaps also something which is important, and, and I, uh, I say it in the context of the, the US-Europe uh, uh, relationship, um, uh, at least in France, I'm not speaking of Hungary because I don't know of Hungary, but you know, in France, people are a little bit uh, laid back. Uh, and in the US, what I noticed from the beginning is that you need to be very professional in what you do. So uh, when you organize an event, uh, it, must be, uh, it must be perfect. Huh? So you cannot have, uh, I would say, uh, flaws or things like that. So, even in, in this uh, philanthropy uh, business in a way. So you need to be very professional and to ensure that your events are organized uh, professionally, that there is no, no little issues here or there. So my, my uh, advice on this would be to say, okay, so perhaps if you want to organize events to support your cause, you organize perhaps smaller events, uh, not with uh, as many people as you could have imagined at the beginning. Uh, you, you, you restrict your ambition, but you do it very professionally. So uh, I think this is very important if you want to succeed. Wow, thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, so much, Michelle and Flavia. And in the interest of time, this is, I mean, this conversation is just, Hopefully it's just the beginning of getting everyone to think about, including uh, those on the panel, right? To think about how do we cultivate personal relationships uh, that go beyond resources. I mean, resources are quite important, but I think it's it's from my takeaway is understanding how do we give and get, right? Like it's a dynamic process, it sounds like. So thank you, Michelle and Flavia for being so open and transparent about your experiences and also highlighting some of the challenges as well as caveats, right? Like what are the privileges that have helped uh, an institution like Notre Dame on the way, not with sending that working very hard to make sure that it continues to have the credibility that it has. Um, so thank you for that. I want to thank also our partners at Faircom New York and NIOC Foundation on behalf of KBF US for your collaboration and um, of course, willingness to put this together all the way here. Um, with that said, thank you to our audience members for your time and incredible questions as well as active engagement. Your questions underscore that. Um, I'll hand it over to Andrea to close us out. Thank you. Thank you for from me also a fast, fast uh, closing. Thank you, Candy, Flavia, and Michelle. This was very, very useful. I think here in Hungary for several organizations. So I hope we can use this uh, tool in the future. And uh, also, uh, just for the audience, we really would like to uh, go on and continue with the cooperation with KBF US, but also to show other possibilities and, uh, and uh, fundraising tools in the future. So we hope we meet again in, uh, in the autumn time. So thank you everyone for being here. And uh, if you have any question, you will find all our contacts uh, uh, later we will send you and uh, if you have any question for neok you can find me anytime thank you very much thank you thank you thank you very much thank you. goodbye bye thank you bye